Howdy, and welcome to the Growing the Next Version of You show. My name is Mike Rochelle. I'm a strategic influencer who collects meaningful relationships, actionable philosophies, and methods to help people and organizations refine their purpose for results growth. Every week, I chat with thought leaders as we explore leadership as a mind, body, and spirit, yes, an inside-out experience that helps us grow and make the world a better place. Join me. Well, Laxman, uh, like we just said, it's great to have you out here on a uh, beautiful Saturday morning. Thanks for uh, taking the time to drive all the way over from, where, <laughs> is it Plano? Oh, it's Frisco. Frisco, okay. Uh, it's a Highland Village. It seems like we're on the other side of the world because of the lake, right? <laughs> no, no, not it's, many, pleasure is all mine. Not yeah. that many miles, but. Uh, so um, what we're going to do today, I'm going to read uh, a, a little bit of your bio and your resume. Um, and then I'm going to ask you to talk about kind of where you came from, what made you what you are, right, from a mind, body, spirit perspective. And I want to go there from a spirit perspective because that's kind of the, the, the whole purpose of the show. Um, but then we're going to have uh, multiple conversations about topics that we've both agreed that we're going to have. Yeah. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about your uh, singing career. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and probably get Paul to come in on that conversation because he's the musician at uh, UNT. So um, looking forward to this and thanks. Oh, absolutely. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So uh, Laxman has been married for 19 years to, to Sumatra Krishnan. And they have one child, uh, Panavi. Pranav Ayer. Pranav Ayer. Sorry. And uh, he's been uh, in the United States for 24 years, uh, came from India uh, by way of Canada. Yep. Uh, did uh, primary school in, uh, in India or uh, undergraduate, then uh, moved to Canada and then did your master's. In, uh, and we'll get into those details uh, later, but in uh, Michigan. Um, he's also been involved in music since his college days and was part of a college music band. And he started training formally in music at the very young age of 40. <laughs> that is a good one. Um, he is also the secretary and volunteer for the Indian Classic Music Circle. That's ICM, ICMCDFW.org and performs a few concerts a year. Um, he's a senior executive at Mr. Cooper. That's how we met um, and other great financial institutions here in town focused on revenue management and business intelligence. Um, I'm going to read a little bit, Laxman. I'm not going to drain it of your resume because everybody can find you on LinkedIn. Yep. Right. As, as well as myself. Um, but uh, Laxman is a talented and results focused senior leader offering 22 plus years of success in complex and competitive environments. A strategic thinker utilizing database methodology to solve complex business problems. He offers proven ability to build, mentor, and develop effective, successful, and motivated teams and is committed to identifying and leveraging opportunities for growth. Uh, his core competencies uh, and achievements are uh, leadership and management, communication, creativity and innovation, project management, and revenue management. And that's your primary responsibility at work now. Yep. Um, Currently, he's the Senior Vice President of Revenue Management and BI at Mr. Cooper for the last few years. Uh, prior to that, he was the SVP of Business Intelligence at Pacific Union here in Dallas as well. Uh, before that, the VP of Business Intelligence at uh, Pacific Union. Before that, an AVP of Leadership Program and Qualitative and Analytics um, for uh, Bank of America um, and had multiple rows at Bank of America uh, after uh, being at Tenneco Automotive uh, for several years as well. Um, before that, he was an engineer um, at multiple places, both in India and it looks like in Canada, I'm guessing. Canada was primarily college, but okay. India and the U.S., yeah. Okay, got it. So from an education perspective, and this is kind of where we connect, uh, he went to school uh, uh, 
well, middle school and high school and college at PSG, College of Technology, with my friend um, uh, Shiva from Cloudix, um, and uh, a master's of science at the University of Western Ontario. That was the piece that I didn't know. And then uh, also a uh, MBA from the Ross School of Business in Ann Arbor, Michigan, from the University of Michigan. So well-educated, um, and you've been here for quite a bit uh, of time. We'll see y'all November 8th with the Ransomware Security Panel, how we survived ransomware and how you can too. It's gonna to be a great show at the OrthoFix Labs in Plano. See you there. We'll see y'all November 8th with the Ransomware Security Panel, how we survived ransomware and how you can too. It's going to be a great show at the OrthoFix Labs in Plano. See you there. So uh, you've had three different cultures that you've lived in too, which is a fascinating thing for me. My mother uh, was an immigrant. She came with my dad from Germany. So I have that cultural influence. And then my wife is from Puerto Rico. So I have Germanic, French, and Latin in this family. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, it's all it's a it's a beautiful mix, right? Yeah. So you've had uh, some really cool experiences too. So, but let's go back to the beginning. Where were you born, and what were your influences from a mind, body, spirit perspective? So, uh, again, Mike, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. So, um, born in India, uh, in a state called Kerala. It's a state in uh, South India. Uh, it's a village. Actually, it's interesting, right? Because you know, me and I have an older sister. My mom, my older sister, was actually conceived in a hospital, right? And with me, she had somehow decided, she said, you know what, I'm going to risk this. And then she, when I was uh, actually brought to uh, life uh, by a midwife, oh, wow. right? Uh, in a house in a village in Kerala, right? So I always used to joke with my mom. She's not uh, alive anymore, but mm -hmm. I always used to joke with my mom saying, you know, you took a risk with me, oh. right? And um, well, she must have had a really easy first I know. delivery. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but you know, uh, that's where I was born. Then uh, all my education was all in a city called Coimbatore in Tamil Nadu, in a state called Tamil Nadu in India. And that's where I met Shiva, right? You know, uh, through my high school, middle school, uh, high school, then did my uh, engineering. So in language is Tamil. Primary language is Tamil. That's yeah. what we speak at home. Yeah. Uh, you know, even today, that's what uh, we speak at home. Uh, my son tries to speak it. But whenever I need some comedy or sense of humor, I just ask my son to speak that, and you know, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. So, um, and uh, but you know, very uh, very uh, comfortable with English, and then we sure. also learned Hindi, which is the national language of India. So right. very comfortable with that as well. I also know another language, Malayalam, which is the state in Kerala. I know it in the sense I can understand it. You know, uh, it becomes a comedy when I start speaking that yeah. language. But my wife grew up in Kerala, so she was extremely uh, you know, fluent in that. Okay. So four languages, and, and I'm, that's good. You know, it keeps it, um, you know, I always uh, take pride in the fact that I know a few languages, which is, uh, yeah. I always joke with my colleagues at work saying that you can abuse me in one language, I can abuse <laughs> you back in four languages, right? So be careful when, yeah. you, you know, when you abuse me. Well, the interesting thing, I think, uh, in talking with... Uh, Shiva and uh, Satya uh, in Seattle, I learned that Tamil is actually an ancient language. Oh, yeah, it is. It, it predates Hindi quite a bit. Yep. And some of the, uh, the religious or spiritual writings predate a, a lot of the other Indian spiritual Correct. writings. Correct. So it's an it's a ancient language, an ancient culture. Uh, which is a an interesting thing. Oh, it's an extremely hard, difficult language to learn too. Mm. Extremely hard with all because it's so ancient, right? You've got mm. so many scriptures to it. The history is uh, long, right? And um, it's uh, so it's a pretty complicated language to actually master, right? When somebody comes and says, "I'm a doctor of philosophy with Tamil literature," I'll be like, "Oh yeah, you must be good." It takes a while, so uh, it's a it's a great language, and uh, just don't see too many people speaking much yeah. anymore. Even if you go to India, because everybody is in English medium schools, and right. you know the mentality is: I'm paying so much fee, school fee for it. You learn English, start speaking that, <laughs> stop speaking Tamil. Yeah. That's a great language, yeah. Yeah, 
It's interesting. I, I, I think I read the, the creation story and obviously translated from Tamil. I don't speak Tamil and I don't know it, but I can read English. <laughs> um, and it, there's actually a lot of parallels uh, with, with the other creation stories from other cultures as well. So it's, it's interesting. Yep, absolutely. We don't doubt it at all. But, yeah. Yeah. So that's background. So then uh, was there a, a faith base to your upbringing? Is absolutely. Yeah. Right. I grew up in a very, very conservative family. Uh, I mean, I, I, while we were growing, I actually grew up in a joint family, right? My dad and his two brothers, one older, one younger brother. We all lived in the same house till my seventh grade, if I'm not, no, till my fifth grade. We were all in the same house. So, um, you know, cousins, you know, me and my sister, I, my dad's younger brother has uh, one daughter, so she's there. And my dad's older brother had three kids, right? Two daughters and one son. So, you know, think about it, three, two, four, six kids in the house. Right. And uh, then the next house, right, had uh, my uh, grandfather's uh -huh. brother's family, uh -huh. right? So it's basically my dad's cousins, yeah. right? And their kids, right? Yeah. So it was a blast, you know, there are eight sure. kids in the house all the time. So... And you had plenty of adults to make sure you weren't getting into... Plenty of adults and very conservative families. So there was always something going on in the house, right? And when you look at it, especially this was a, it's a good time to talk about. Today, I'm going to walk you through a process about how to create something from nothing in the world. Uh, and I'm going to do it with a story uh, from when my wife and I moved from Pasadena, California to uh, Highland Village, Texas, uh, back in the year 2000. Uh, prior to that, I had been a divisional CIO at uh, C.B. Richard Ellis for about six years and uh, had the opportunity in Pasadena to use some of the bike trails and things we had there. Also uh, traveled up to Microsoft to uh, service my client who was using several of the product, soft, software products that uh, we had created at C.B. Richard Ellis to manage their property globally. Um, and in that, we would stay in, and often we would use bikes to ride the trails from Bellevue, Washington to Redmond. And it was a blast, and I really enjoyed those trails. Uh, so when I moved to Dallas, I thought, well, maybe this, uh, this new neighborhood we're going into would have that. But we did. So, um, started creating this vision of what it would be like to have bike lanes and trails, uh, not only on the city uh, streets, uh, but uh, in the byways. Uh, and even around the lake, um, and found some like-minded people at the Highland Village Parks Foundation, um, and we created the trail system here in Highland Village from year 2000 to about 2010. Uh, there are still building trails and things around the city, uh, so it's an ongoing process, uh, but I want to use that as a way to show you how to bring great things into being. The first step is to visualize. And what you have to do here is define what it is that you want. You need to be able to define it in such a way in your mind's eye that you can feel it, that you can see it, that you can experience it, so that you can bring it into the present. When you talk through September through uh, November, right? It's it's you know it's filled with. Hindu festivals, right? right? You've got Ganesh Chaturthi, which is, uh, you know, that's, that just got over, right? Then you're starting the Navratri uh, festival right now, which will go, starts about uh, late part of this month and will go for two weeks. And following that will be uh, Diwali. Were so those like harvest festivals? What, what, what were they based on? So uh, Ganesh Chaturthi is basically, you know, you're, uh, uh, you know, paying your respects to Lord Ganesha, okay. right? There are some historical events, you know, there's a background to it. Okay. And uh, Navratri is basically, I mean, uh, it, it, you've got nine nights, right? You're performing different rituals. And then you uh, then you follow that up with, uh, towards the end of Navratri, you've got, again, uh, you know, Saraswati Puja, which is basically your, uh, you know, uh, she's the goddess of uh, education. So you're paying your respect there. Then you've got Diwali, right? Which is a festival of light, right? And, uh, that one I know. Yeah, that one is the most famous, right? Right. So you got that. So it's a it's a great time. So by this time would be great when we're growing up, right? We're looking. People are visiting each other. Mm. Uh, you know, there's something going on. There's some kind of a uh, ritual going on every day in the house, and um, so 
kind of brought a discipline to all of us too right and you get up you pray uh, you know you, uh, you know, go through your day then you know you, before night you just you know say thank you you pray and then you go back to go to go to bed right i mean it brings a certain discipline i'm not a completely you not know, totally religious guy by any means yeah. uh, but uh, you know i go to temple every sunday and you know that make brings a certain calm in my to myself mm-hmm. most importantly keeps my dad happy that's a good that's an important <laughs> thing and he he lives with you no he uh, he lives he's alone in india now but yeah. um, you know we try to get him here at least 4 uh, to 5 months a year if you are lucky he agrees otherwise you know he's been in that town for a long time you know he's got his brothers and uh, he's got his uh, friends you know it's, it's hard to make the change yeah but yeah that's uh, that's the background that's uh, how we grew up so so the, the interesting my um my sister-in-law my wife's sister married an italian guy and he grew up in in uh i think it was the bronx if i have it right but they had a multi multi-story house where the grandparents lived on the first floor the first brother lived on the second floor the third brother oh, nice. and then they had cousins in other houses so that culturally is very similar uh to to the italian at least the original italian community that came over you know uh, last year there was an article i forget which uh, was it washington post or wall street journal i forget there was an article talking about uh, multiple generations living in the same house mm-hmm. because of, you know where the house prices have come up right so much right. so there was an article about that happening in the us and i jokingly told you know some of my colleagues at work saying that cycle. no what i'm used to it man yeah. that's what we you know happened till i was in fifth grade sixth grade till you know people started moving out to their own houses right yeah uh it's it's not such a bad thing yeah you know when you know kids start moving in kids start living with you i've, I've enjoyed it i always like having people over like i said uh, highlight for last week was you know my in-laws came in my dad left for india he was with us for four months for five months here then he left went back uh, in september and my in-laws came over uh so i mean i enjoy that having parents at home you know uh, uh, it's a great thing having people at home i always enjoy it very cool yeah it's it, it is uh it's a balm to the soul especially when you have family that are that are blood relatives right i mean i love everybody just in general anyway but um with family you put up with their stuff because their family <laughs> and you can tell them things that uh that because they're family tell. right 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 and you can tell them things that you can't tell anybody else to yeah you know my brother in law jokes about us all the time me and my sister right you put us in a room uh for more than an hour two hours right and we are at, we are like this we start going off each other right you know you know it's, it's a, some some kind of a verbal fight is going on at the end yeah. of two hours so my brother in law my wife they always joke saying that we need to keep these guys apart after 2 hours we can't have them in the same room right but we do it because you know the family you yeah. know you speak your mind and yeah. uh, you have no qualms about hey that's okay let's brush it let's move let's brush those things let's move on right yeah. we do it all the time and uh, you're absolutely right you yeah. can do it to your family so so part of the reason that i'm doing this show is to is to highlight um i guess differences that make us stronger right instead of instead of focusing on differences that divide us um and and i think i see a lot of similarities from a from a love and compassion and a caring uh from your cultural experience that i have from my cultural experience too now i didn't have my grandparents moved, lived in a different house i didn't have that exact experience but i know people that have had that experience too um so it's uh it's beautiful no oh, absolutely right? Absolutely. So, so that's so I appreciate you sharing that. You got to define your vision so well that you can feel it, you can taste it, you can experience it. You can feel the wind blowing through your hair. So, um let's talk just world view in general. How would how would you characterize your world view because you've you've lived in a predominantly hindu um uh, culture you've I, i don't know how you would characterize canada maybe you can do that and then and then here is predominantly a christian culture but we are also opening to other other ways of being as well so how do you think of world view laxman 2022 
you know, maybe even comparing yourself to what you thought before? You know, let's, you know, growing up in India, you know, let me take a step back. I never thought much about cultural differences till now in the last three or four years. I'll be sure. completely honest with you, right? Back growing up in India, the high school we went to was a Christian convent, mm. right? We, every morning we stood up and said, Our Father in heaven, holy be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be said. We said it every single day, wow. right? We didn't think too much about it. It was a morning prayer. We just said it, right? Nobody and said it was a beautiful education, right? And That's nobody why said we're sending you no, there. Yeah, I mean, you can talk to Shiva. He'll tell you, tell you the same thing. You know, we had a speaker in the uh, classroom. Morning, eight o'clock, the speaker will blast. I think eight forty-five. We all stood up. We'll all say that and say the prayer, and then we'll resume with classes. Nobody said, "Oh, I'm a Hindu. I'm a Brahmin. I'm not going to say that prayer." Nobody said. I don't remember a single friend of mine saying that. Yeah. Right. And uh, at the same time, nobody in our, uh, you know, we had fathers running, he was right. a principal, right? Nobody, I don't remember anybody forcing us saying, oh, you need to say that prayer or otherwise outside. You can keep quiet. I knew guys that kept quiet, mm -hmm. um, but you know, they weren't forced out of the class because they kept quiet. So when you're talking about tolerance, diversity, inclusiveness, you know, I, I think we grew up in a culture that was already diverse and inclusive, mm -hmm. right? So I never felt any of that. And you mentioned that I grew up in a Hindu society. I don't think so. While I did, a, we did a lot of things in the house. A lot of my friends were Christians, Muslims. I mean, you know, I would stay in their houses. You know, we'd stay in each other's houses. Right. Uh, you know, I was vegetarian, so they would cook meat. They'd cook vegetarian separately for me, so I could eat. Never thought too much about all of that, right? Right. But we started to think about all of that only in the last, I would say, 10 years. Mm. You know, where you think, okay, I'm a Hindu, you're a Muslim, you're a Christian, you're this, you're that. We're thinking about all of that now. Because there's so much material being put out. Right. right which, and information could be good, information could be bad. Right. right. And if you start taking all your history lessons from Wikipedia and YouTube and uh, LinkedIn, you know, aka social media, then, you know, you, you could very quickly develop a very biased opinion. Yeah. So to answer your question, long story short, never thought much about cultural differences. Yeah. You know, we just we were just a bunch of kids, you know, we went to school hard, competed hard, and, uh, you know, we just focused on uh, you know, getting ahead in life. That's all we thought about. Fast forward, came to Canada, again, the same story, you know, you know I had a, a few few friends that grew up in North India, met with them. And uh, never really said, okay, you grew up here with all of this. I mean, in fact, a good friend in North India, I mean, he was, he, he was there, he was married with a kid. And, um, you know, he's from uh, the uh, Sikh, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, he was from the Sikh uh, uh, community. And uh, they, uh, every Sunday, there was a Gurudwara, that is their place of worship, right? And every Sunday they would go there. I would go there every Sunday just, you know, for the food. <laughs> You know, I'm exactly. cooking myself. That's the first time I'm cooking myself when yeah. I moved to Canada. And, you know, there's only so much of your own cooking when you, <laughs> you can eat, especially when you're calling and mom, your mom and saying, how do I do this? How do I make this? Right? All the trial and error. And they've got this tasty food out there, langar as we call it, right? Langar is extremely tasty. So I would just go there and his wife would pack me. After oh, this wow. done, she knew she would pack me all the food. I'll bring it home. Again, we'll never... For a couple of days. For a week, <laughs> Mike. For a week. That's awesome. Yeah. Lived on $10 grocery bill for a week. Wow. That saved me. Right? So never really thought about all of the cultural differences even when I was in Canada. Very great. Beautiful country. Very acceptable. Very, very accepting. Sorry. Very Where inclusive. Where did you live? London, Ontario. Okay. Right? You know, I mean, it's a funny story. I landed in Canada December 28th, I think, with a denim jacket. Oh my goodness. Think about it, right? <laughs> Who lands in Ontario with a denim jacket? I just got it. You never experienced that kind of cold. No, that's how much yeah. awareness I had, right? So the guy who picked me up from the airport, he was like, "Okay, you need to make some changes tomorrow." Yeah. So, um, but you know, I've, I've got a lot of help. You know, my prof was great. Uh, the people around me were great. Um, you know, the only time they got a bit upset was when I told them I'm moving to the United States for a job. That's the only time they were like a bit disappointed. I would say some of my friends in Canada. But um, again, very accepting, very, very inclusive. I had a great time. And um, again, same thing in the US when I came here. So far, 
I'm, I mean, you see, you hear about all these racist attacks everywhere, saying, you know, people's worried about for your lives and all of that. I've never felt unsafe in this country. Mm. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. And you've lived in Dallas all the time? Or? No, I was in Michigan. Oh, that's right. Michigan for a good uh, uh, 12 years. Mm. And, you know, heck, I, I used to go to Detroit downtown and go to Greek town mm. in the middle of the night. Yeah, you know, we, me and my friends, we used to goof around there and, you know, we had no issues. And so it's not like, you know, like I said, I think maybe it's just me. I mean, me and my, we talked to some of my friends that we've been here for 20 plus years. We've never really, really experienced anything to be unsafe. Mm -hmm. So culturally, I've always been lucky to be in a very inclusive culture. And to me, culture, the way you define culture is basically, you know, just be fair, you know, be accepting. Yeah. And you know, have a bit of patience. I think that's what we are missing today. Yeah. Have a bit of, bit of patience and open your ears and eyes. And I think we'll be fine. Yeah. And that's my take on that. A bit philosophical, but you know, I, like I said, you know, I've, I've been okay. It's not, I've not really experienced anything out of the norm. Yeah. When all the three countries have lived. Awesome. So, what are the things that you that you would describe that that um, and for me, different is not bad. Okay, just to, to make sure that you're understanding what I'm asking. Sure. What are the differences that you experience in those cultures that you think that the others could adopt and thrive with? In other words, it's it's about a combination of of uh, you know one plus one plus one is three instead of one plus one minus one, right? It's always like, what can we, what can we learn from each other and what can we um, adopt that the other is doing? So I've had a bit more exposure to Christianity, right? Because I went to a Christian school yeah. and, uh, you know, been in North America for, uh, if we put Canada into the picture, into the mix, it's about 26 years now. Yeah. So, and, uh, you know, some of my bosses were hardcore Christians, right? And uh, so I've heard stories. So one thing I've noticed is, you know, how well a church brings, provides a support structure, right? Right. And, you know, you, we live in a very capitalistic society, yeah. right? Hire and fire is the nature of the game. Yeah. Right. You know, when the market is good, economy is good, we hire people. When the economy is bad, we people let people go because we protect the bottom line. Right. right? And I've noticed a lot of times the church or the community, I should say, say, come together, right? And say, okay, we will provide you the, we are the backstop for you, right. for lack of better word, we are the backstop for you yep. for a good period of time before you go and, and land on your feet again, yep. right? And I think that's a great thing. I don't think there are too many communities, I'm, I'm not aware of it, I'm not saying they don't do it. Right. They might be doing it in smaller scales, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure they do it in smaller scales. But the scale is a bit more, uh, uh, it's a bit bigger here, right? I've noticed that. I think that is something that we can take away from that, right? That's great. And now you talk about the, um, uh, you know, the, the Hindu faith, right? I mean, it's the inclusivity, right? When you talk about it, you know, people joke about the Hindu culture. You've got so many gods. The way it, my counter to that is, you know, we are so inclusive. We have so many people, right? <laughs> uh, you know, so, you know, and when you look at it, it is so spread out, right? There are so many sub-communities within the broad umbrella of Hinduism, right? There are sure. so many sub-communities. So which kinds of, kind of forces us uh, to be inclusive, right? Kind of forces that on us. And, you know, we learn to do that. Again, there are the tail cases, right? You always have in those. Every, in every religion. You always have the tails. Yeah. We just need to choose to ignore the tail. And I can say the same thing about uh, the, I've had a lot of friends, you know, who belong to the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. They're great people, yeah. great people. I mean, very endearing, um, you know, um, very, very endearing. And uh, you know, so it's, I think the the, I mean, what I've seen and experienced, you know, living with these people, you know, and talking to these people and having them, you know, having, what do you say, being friends with a lot of them over 20 plus years is, I think everybody means well. Yeah. Overall, when you, if you look at it as a normal distribution, right, everybody means well with the exception of the tails. You always have, have the tail risk, right, in all the communities. You ignore that, I think everybody's message is the same. So 
there is you pay close attention you there is always you know you can learn from each other yeah as you get clarity on your vision you need to start articulating what it is that you want to do and sharing that feeling and that vision with others to see if there's anybody out there that shares it. In our case, uh, it was the city government, but we had a Parks Foundation that had already started planning several years before I got involved. The school that I went to for leadership development was uh, run by a guy named Dick Dooley, who was a CIO before they called them CIOs uh, for banks in Chicago. And he was friends with Mortimer Adler who was the, uh, the great books okay. guy. Uh, also the editor, I think, of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And they, they talked about the great books and it is what are the great ideas that came out of the great books. And, and literally what they did was very similar to what the, uh, the guys that, that wrote the Oxford Dictionary back when it originally was written. Okay. They had a bunch of scholars basically get each of the books and, and, and highlight what are the, the what are the great ideas and then they would put it down well, in that's the book, a great and they idea. created this great books thing right um and originally that was the kind of the 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 course that that we were using as the basis for the leadership development program that i grew up in at the, the society for information management uh, but then the more i looked at it um i'm thinking you know the thing about it is that it leaves out all of the eastern uh knowledge which some, some of which predate some of the great books, right? Because the great books go back to the Greeks. Correct. Uh, but they're but like Tamil and there are, other, there are other cultures that have older learnings. Um, so then uh, I was introduced to virtue ethics. Now I have an undergraduate in liberal arts with a theology major. It was Christianity major, right? Mm -hmm. So what I've been doing since I graduated from that in 1990 is, is continuing to educate myself on, and we had, um, I can't remember what, comparative religion, I think was one of the courses that I okay. took. Um, but it was, it was primarily a Christian apologetics look at that okay. topic. Um, what I've been doing is meeting people like you and Shiva and others and learning from them what their culture really means and what it goes back to. Um, so then, what I landed on was the virtue ethics. Now, the Greeks were the ones that codified it, right? Um, so Aris, uh, I think it was Plato that wrote The, the Good Life. Okay. Uh, but the whole conversation that came to the U.S. Constitution about the seeking happiness thing was based on virtue ethics. And virtue ethics basically just says, what are the standards by which we can live that make us most happy? Because if you're doing good things, you feel good inside, and then you you share that with your with right. your fellow person, right? right. And um, so it's a, it's a really interesting study. Um, so then, so that's when I joined a group called the um, oh I haven't even thought of the name of it for a while, the uh, Virtues International, and it was started by a bunch of Baha'i faith people, and Baha'i were uh, it was a it was an offshoot of Islam and Christianity okay. in the Middle East in Israel, and they're peace people. They they believe in peace as the as the path forward. So they created this this group to codify what the virtues were, um, because they saw the lack of training that was happening because of the pullback from religion. Character wasn't being taught in the schools. So their their whole plan didn't necessarily work and but it's still a possibility was to translate that um, what used to be the prayers in school to codification of ethical behavior uh, because even if you don't have a, a quote-unquote religious affiliation those behaviors are things that through time every people group every um, religion every uh, pe people have eventually come to these are the ways to live um and i think that's a good what i call it the rosetta stone between the between the faiths uh, because there are differences in the way that we say things there are differences in the way that we believe uh, but by and large to your point 80 percent of it overlaps yep now I, I have not done the math there have been multiple people who have done it i don't know exactly what 
you know, what the exact layover is. But if we focus on 80% and not on the two or 3% on both sides, right? So from a worldview, I think that makes more sense. And we can, we can not only get along, but we can thrive. Yeah, if only, right? <laughs> yeah, if only. What is, what is the topic that you have on your mind that you wanted to talk about? And how does it apply to this? So, I mean, it's more about what keeps me up, right? I mean, not really. Mm -hmm. I sleep well. But yeah, what do you think so about you mostly? Think, what do sure, you think about, right? Sure. Subconscious mind. Mental health is something that, you know, comes to mind. And it's... Never used to be on my mind until before the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we went through this unprecedented pandemic, right? That's why we call it what it is. And then you uh, follow through for two years, right? Everybody, I mean, you just, you know, how the world came together, pulled all the resources to basically curtail it in whatever form of fashion, right? I mean, you can argue what went wrong and what, you know, everybody can play Monday morning quarterbacks, but at the end of the day, right? At the end of the day, uh, you know, we were able to, I think the world really did come together to make sure that we, sure. Cut, we curtailed it in whatever fashion we did. Yeah. Right? So when you came out of it and then you suddenly see what it's doing, you know, the, the after effects of, you know, all you, the, the money supply that you put into the market, what it is done, people talk about the fiscal policy, you know, the inflation that the Feds are trying to control and you have this battle going on between the Feds and the markets right now, right? right? It takes a lot of toll. It takes a, it's a, it takes a toll on everybody, right? It, you know, across the different strata of life, right? Because kids, I was just watching the news the other day, and in one of the school districts, it's a big deal for kids to go back because some of these kids have started kindergarten in virtual school, right? So suddenly, they're getting exposed going into school. They don't have the social skills. <laughs> it, I mean, uh, all the they things probably, that you're supposed they to probably don't know. They, they don't know what they don't know, yeah. right? And it's not something, I mean, these your experiences make you, you know, it's not fair to expect a seven-year-old or a six-year-old to go sit there, right, away from your parents, mm -hmm. right? And then, so, you know, when you put yourself in that position and start to think about it, it's a big deal. So what kind of support can you give them? Right? It's, a, it's very important to think about it, right? And, you know, some of the kids went through their middle school, right? Like my son went through the entire middle school, um, not, you know, 95% you know, of his middle school, not actually, seventh grade, entire seventh grade was uh, virtual, half of sixth grade was virtual, eighth grade he was able to go back in. That was good because now it was a good transition to high school. Now that is good. But when you talk about people that went, you know, two years of uh, prior, you know, elementary school and then boom, virtually and then landed up in middle school, it is a transition, right? And same thing with people. There are people that started their careers virtually. They come back into the office, right? Some of them, they're going back into the office. It's an entirely new ball game, right? So I think it is something that I, I'm not here to preach. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not here to advise, but it's something that we all need to take a few minutes to think about and saying, what can you do? You know, talk to your family. Uh, my wife does a great job about, you know, you know, I'm the jumping jack in the house. Right to me, everything, and I, I that's that's my nature. Yeah, she is a calm one, she brings a certain sense of calm in the house, saying that she waits for me, lets me jump around, and all that. Have you stopped? So then, you know, she uh, starts talking sense, speaking sense into me. My son is a good combo of both of us, he's a lot calmer than me, but she makes sure that you know we have some family time every week, so we talk through things, and you know, that I think is good for mental health, you know. And that's something that I think all of us should think about. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh After you figured out how to articulate your vision, you have to find those that actually share your dream as well. Uh, a lot of times, in, in our case, uh, the, the director of the, the uh, parks department was a great ally in not only packaging and getting the ideas into a format that they could be funded by both the local city and the federal government, uh, but had experience in doing that, so she was a wonderful blessing to us. Her name was Rhoda Savage. So Rhoda, if you see this, thank you. Here we are in one of the entrances to the trail that's been here for quite a long time here in Highland Village. And we're going to go over to the map. You can see that it's multiple miles long, 2.7 miles long. It actually continues on uh, to Double Tree Park now. I think, there's, I think there is something there. Um, 
And I think you're right. I think it starts at the how at the home, right? Absolutely. And then and then um, and then with schools, um, one of the one of the things that that I find that is you know obviously we have church, but we also have associations. Uh, of, of people that are trying to do things in the in the in the uh, marketplace that are not necessarily um, money making. They're not for profits that that help people in particular professions to become Correct. more you know better professionals in that particular area. So I think the, the all of those kinds of things can contribute to that. Part of what I'm seeing now, though, is that because everybody got used to staying home. They're staying home. <laughs> they like the flexibility. So it's it's hard to get people to come out. Oh yeah, you know so it's a big deal to get any people to uh, come back into the office full time. Yeah, nobody wants to do it. So we have uh, uh, with the Association for Business Technology Professionals on the twenty seventh. We have a, a gentleman named Bill Dimsky, uh, who is a double PhD. He has a master's in divinity. Oh wow! He's the uh, he's one of the board of directors of the Discovery Institute, and he's coming to speak about information mm -hmm. um, and how it is alike in business and biology. So it'll be a con kind of a continuation of the conversation that Stephen Meyer started in January with our association. So um, would love for you guys to come out and hear him. And I'll put a, a little ad in here uh, at this point so you can understand that a little better. Um, the other thing that uh, that I'm involved in, and I think you're going to be coming with me too to the prayer breakfast um, on uh, the 30th of um, September here at the Irving Convention Center, uh, we're going to be uh, talking with the uh, who is it? It's the CIO of the uh, of A and M's uh, system. So all of the schools of A and M, I think he has 100,000 students or more that he handles um, and he's going to be the keynote speaker there. So it'll be an interesting event as well. But those kinds of, those kinds of things in the community, I think are, are necessary to help to get us out again and to bring us together um, in a way that's, that's important. Yeah, I think it's important. Yep. Yeah. So let's talk about um, one of the things that, um, that I didn't know about you before I got your uh, your your, uh, your bio is that you're into Indian classical music. And Paul, get your get your mic ready because I think there were some conversations we were going to have there. So describe for me, Paul, and the audience what Indian um, classical music is. Um, and you were in a band in college, but was it doing classical music? No, no, that was, it was different. Uh, it was that was, that was a slight. Okay. So, what, so give, a, give me a background on the, the Indian music scene and, and what you're engaged in. So uh, I'm by no means a professional. So let's make it very clear. <laughs> I'm a very, very, uh, uh, what do you say? Uh, uh, one of the lower level, uh, amateur ranks. That's where my level is. Okay. But classical music, I always wanted to learn. Right, uh, because I've always dabbled in singing. I like to sing. Like I'm, I'm not very good, but I like to sing. Always dabbled in uh, music, and uh, so I got the opportunity to learn classical music. Uh, you know, like I said, when I was 40 years old. And um, so there's this uh, person, Chitranjan. He's a great friend of mine. He's also an engineer at Texas Instruments. He runs a music school. Okay. Sabrang Gurkul Music. Uh, he's a great guy. He's a fantastic guy. He's, you know the way he teaches. Right. I mean. You can teach a kid, you know, teaching adults is a pain. Yeah. Right. <laughs> We're already set in our ways. Exactly. You know, you can, you can tell the kid, you know, I'm going to call your parents. You don't do your homework. You now, what are you going to tell the adult? Yeah. A 40 year old adult, you know, you don't, you don't practice. You can't do much. Right. So you need a lot of patience. Right. And sure. he has that. And that's what, and the way he teaches also, he provides an overall framework he gives you, you know, you know, everything is do re mi. Right, you have those seven notes. All you know, whether it's Western music, classical music, you know, it's all about those seven notes, right? Indian yeah. classical, Western classical, and what you do, all the permutations, combinations of those seven notes, right? And then you got, the, I mean, you got the uh, flat notes, right? You put those flat notes into play. You got more uh, combinations and permutations and combinations. And what we call in classical music is we call it as a raga. Right, depending on what the combination, you all the seven notes, we give it a certain name. We use five notes, we give a certain name. You use all the sharp notes, we give a certain name. So these are different 
I think there are, I don't know, I don't even know the count. There are many, many what we call as rags, right? That's what we call it. And so there's a structure to it, right? Uh, and it, it brings a certain structure to your mind when you're trying to sing. And I like it. You know, it's a lot of, it's a combination. Music to me is a combination of art and science. Sure. Right? The science part is, yeah, you got these five nodes. What are the different combinations I can go? I can go from here to here, here to here to here. Now you've got the two combinations, the three combinations, the four combinations, right? That is the science part of it. Yeah. The art part of it is putting the feel to it, right? And then, uh, so, so it's a good combination. I do it because um, it is something I can always fall back on, right? I have a class on Sundays. Once or twice a week, I sit down to practice, you know, you forget everything else. So it's, it's, it's good. And um, so, so for uh, our audience, um, you and I had talked about Ravi Shankar. Is, is Ravi Shankar's music or the uh, that genre, is that considered classical? He's done both, right? He's okay. done classical. He's a classical uh, sitar player. He's also done a lot of fusion work, worked with a lot of uh, Western classical people. Beatles. And, um, yeah, he's, okay. he's, you know, he's collaborated with the Beatles as well. Yeah. So he's done all, you know, okay. and that's what makes him so great, okay. right? He's not, uh, but yeah, he's also done uh, classical music. Okay. And then, who are the who are the artists now that are that are big in the Indian music scene? I mean, when you talk of classical music, what we learn in Hindustani, you got you know Pandit Bhimsen Joshi. I mean, I mean, you can you, know, you talk about that. You got you know right now you got Kaushiki, uh, Chakraborty. Uh, so there are many, many, many classical artists there. And um, you know, if you talk, but it's also not about the vocals, right? You talk about flute. You got Hari Prasad Chaurasia. Right, his grandson Rakesh Chaurasia comes and performs now. So you've got a lot of people. I mean, it's a, it's a line of artists, and they go in different tiers as well. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, the list is too long. I don't even know the entire list. And these are just names that pop out because I constantly go back to listening to these people. Um, so yeah, the list is long. Yeah. So one one of the things that I've noticed over during the pandemic, I I watched a lot of The Voice and and these performance shows okay. that. Uh, 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 I can't remember the dance thing. It was like the uh, Dancing with the Stars. No, it wasn't Dancing with the Stars. It was the one that J Lo did. Oh, oh uh, I know what you're talking about. What it was. But anyway, the point is that there for for multiple. I'm pretty sure it was World of Dance. Yeah, World of Dance. So what ha what happens is that there uh, this World of Dance is like a, a competition, and they have everybody from all genres of dance, right? hip hop and there are multiple kinds that I don't even know what they are. <laughs> but the interesting thing is over the last few years, uh, I haven't watched it in about a year or so, I just got busy again with work <laughs> since we're not uh, cloistered in our, uh, in our home. Yeah, those shows, anymore. they amaze me all the time. You've got a lot of those shows in India as well. One yeah. thing that's done is you've brought all these stars yeah. who are hiding somewhere in the closet. Right. It's been, pro it's propelled all of that up. And the quality of mood, that's pretty much lifted the quality of music that's coming out. Yeah. So the, so what I'm getting at is that there were, for several years, there have been, there's been a progression of the Indian teams that come are winning these competitions. Okay. Because of, because of the intricate moves that are, <laughs> that are different than what anybody else has ever done. Right. Now they're, they're kind of mixing up the, in, the traditional Indian with hip hop kind of stuff. Right. Um, fusing it together and making it unique, uh, but that's that's been a really fosters kind of creativity, thing. baby. That's yeah. what it is. And then uh, I'm teaching at DBU, and a lot of our students are uh, are Indian, so I got to learn how to do a, an Indian dance at one of the things that we went to. No, no, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm, one thing I don't remember, I don't remember how to do that. Uh, but, but yeah, it's fun. I like uh, I like different things. Uh, so cool. So what what uh, what do you think uh, what do you think uh, art brings to life that you don't get from spreadsheets and data? Well, uh, it helps you think. It helps you think because it clears your mind up. Yeah. Right. And uh, you know, people constantly do it. Right. I mean. You just uh, some people you know like woodwork and I, you know, I used to work with an engineer back in Michigan his go-to was woodwork right whenever he's stuck somewhere with some problem he just constantly say I'm going to build this and he start going to town with you know um, uh, timber 
all weekend and you know for a lot of people that is uh, that is art for them right for my wife it's painting for my son it's a flute and uh, you know it's a different people for my uh, nephew it's uh, singing uh, so it you know so art has different forms and i think it just simply put plain language it just clears your mind yeah brings a sense of calm into you and it's a it's a good fallback yeah and i think it's in you know, a call it art call it art call it hobby call it anything you want but uh, you know it's a good fallback to clear your mind up yeah definitely well i think it i think it does something for the soul right? absolutely it, just, it fills you with joy that you that you don't necessarily get from crunching numbers and stuff like that. Hey, it's better than drinking alcohol and throwing money on a gambling table. Yeah. But yeah. So, uh one of the things that I I found fascinating and I really appreciate you coming to have this conversation because we've never really gone here to many of these topics and so it, that's I think makes it fresh. Um your work um is uh, is artful too, right? There is very much science to it, but you have to know how to uh how to understand what the trends look like and things like that. So can you can can you kind of describe what it is that you do at a at a high level? So basically uh work in mortgage industry. Yeah. So uh, simply put the way I try to explain uh what I do is so when somebody is looking for a mortgage you go in and say okay I'm looking you, you can just go to google or you can just do lendingtree.com or you know whatever you just log into like I work for Mr. Cooper right. go to mrcooper.com and say I'm looking for this mortgage I'm looking for it in in a state of Texas, city of Frisco. I'm looking for a loan amount of 500k, so on and so forth. You fill in all the parameters. It tells you this is your interest rate. This is how much you bring down to closing. Right. My team does that. All the calculations. You do the the behind, behind the side. back end engine is basically comes from uh, a big portion of that comes from my team. Right. I mean there are other revenue teams that you know um, do a lot of additional steps and. Uh, so that is primary it primarily that's what the responsibility is you know it's pricing revenue analytics and then you know you do well, then it's it's about how can you make money for the company at the same time make sure that you're meeting all the fair lending and all the other regulation regulatory requirements right so you have to so you know you got the you got the properties you the loan profile the borrower profile you have to account for all the geo, you know, the geography right uh, which property state and other different characteristics and then you try to optimize right it becomes an optimizing game mm -hmm. and uh, so that's what we do simply put that's all i do fairly straightforward and then if you look across the industry every organization has somebody like you that's absolutely. doing that same thing absolutely right? so um one of the things that that you and i had talked about a couple of years ago was automating a lot of that stuff and it and and you have now done that done portions of it at least um is that a is that a differentiator when you can absolutely efficient more quickly bring things in mortgage industry is not a revenue game anymore it's more cost and efficiency game when you look at how many you know what are the different mediums i mean for that matter anything right i mean it, everything gets uh customized and commoditized not customized i should say commoditized so quickly yeah it uh, it's not about revenue play it's more of a, about efficiency play these days right because it becomes a cost function pretty quickly so absolutely i mean uh, it's a, it's an absolute differentiator and we are completely you know not only me you know in, in the industry is focused on it significantly sure so the liquidity that was that was forced into the economy during during covid that you referred to earlier <coughs> how, how do you see that impacting us over how long of a period of time um, and and i'll just say that the last time you and i had this conversation i kind of put some plans on hold based on uh, what you told me. So <laughs> hopefully I'm not necessarily, I'm not necessarily, I'm just looking for an update to see what, what, uh, what the, what the, uh, the vision of uh, Laxman is. Uh, and, you know, obviously you don't have to say anything that's uh, proprietary, but no, what, what, what do you see the, the general trends going? And After you've figured out how to articulate your vision, you have to find those that actually share your dream as well. Uh, a lot of times, in, in our case, uh, the, the director of the, the uh, Parks Department was a great ally in not only packaging and getting the ideas into a format that they could be funded by both the local city and the federal government, uh, but had experience in doing that. So she was a wonderful blessing to us. Her name was Rhoda Savage. 
So Rhoda, if you see this, thank you. Here we are in one of the entrances to the trail that's been here for quite a long time here in Highland Village. And we're gonna go over to the map. You can see that it's multiple miles long, 2.7 miles long. It actually continues on uh, to Double Tree Park now. The last step along the way, after you've taken the time to be patient and executed, is to go and enjoy your vision. Go out and, and enjoy what you've created, uh, share it with people, help them to have a better life. After you've then enjoyed it, then it's time to rinse and repeat. And that is to learn and change and grow and vision a new vision, dream a new dream, create something new uh, and continue the cycle of learning throughout life. So I hope that this series has been interesting to you. Uh, it is free of charge on uh, Leadership In as a micro class. And uh, I hope that uh, it's been both uh, entertaining and enjoyable to you and that you go out and create something new today. Thanks and have a great day. Bye-bye. What is that doing to us? So when you look at where we are today, yeah, I mean, in my mind, again, this is all just my opinion, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, um, so, so it's, uh, you know, when we were in the pandemic, suddenly, you know, businesses shut down. So the right thing was to do was to put money in people's pockets, right? So, right. <laughs> excuse me. And uh, so free money, when you get free money and you fast forward into 20, you know, late 2020 and early 2021, and even through mid 2021, you know, businesses started opening. People started going to work, but the stimulus continued you know, providing the free money. So when you've got free income, free disposable income, right, you know, you're going to spend. And when you start spending, you know, it's not, it's going to take a while before you start pulling back. Right. Right. So that's what inflation is all about. Right. And uh, too much inflation is not good. So it's, it's like the whole, the whole, <coughs> excuse kind of me, ahead of its skis a little bit. Yeah. So when you look at uh, data like, uh, so you have multiple data points and you look at data like inflation is up year over year, 8.6%, right? And uh, when you exclude energy and uh, food, it is still up significantly is what you keep hearing, right? And then you say, by the way, employment is also, you know, under 4%, it's full employment. The country has full, it's, it's full employment, right? That's what it's defined as. So employment rate is still at about the 3.6%. And uh, even in August, uh, industry created, uh, you know, United States uh, created uh, 317,000 jobs, right? So when you take all of those factors in and you say, oh man, we're still, you know, the economy is strong, inflation is high, runaway inflation is not good, we need to control it, right? And uh, that's what the feds are doing, right? They're saying, you know, we need to, we have a 2% inflation target, we need to meet it. The market is saying, well, is it really got to be 2%? Why not leave it at 4 right? You don't want to squeeze the lid too much wherein you drag the economy into recession. Mm -hmm. But um, so there is just conflicting views. My view primarily is I think we are in a good spot from a standpoint of corporations because the tech companies are liquid, right? They have cash. Financial institutions have cash, right? And um, services industry is still hiring. Economy is still strong. So I don't think, uh, you know, we've got too much to worry about from an economy standpoint. And I, at some point, the rates will, uh, uh, it'll all normalize. Fairly normal Sooner than later, it should normalize and we should start getting into a new normal, right? Well, gasoline has gone down. I <coughs> part of that may be because they're, they're using the reserves to kind of... Yeah, the reserves have come down, right? I think yeah. it's going to be the lowest in many, many years. What is it, 100, 120 billion? Uh, barrels uh, in uh, by October yeah. because we continue to release the reserves. Something to watch for, yeah. and I think so. But I think it should come. It, it all depends on how the you know the, you got multiple factors going on, right? You got the Europe energy crisis, right? Winter is coming, right? Will they get their supply of natural gas? Mm -hmm. The question. Mm -hmm. You got that. Uh, people are watching over that. Well, here we don't have to worry about that as much as the Europeans. Correct. And then, but you got inflation here that you're watching. You got inflation in Europe that we people are watching. Uh, you got, um, you know, whenever the dollar gets stronger, you got uh, outflow of uh, 
money from emerging markets into the US, right? So emerging markets is worried about that because their cost of capital goes up, right? Mm -hmm. Then uh, a strong dollar again is something of concern because now you're exp you're exporting less, you're importing more, creates a current account uh, imbalance. Right. Uh, the yen is getting weaker. So you've got multiple problems. It's not easy to solve. This is a complex, complex, complex problem. Chinese, the China's economy is also down, right? So uh, people are watching and uh, there is no crystal ball to say this is when everything gets fixed and it will be a normal. Again, what is a normal? Right. We don't know. Well, but fluctuation is normal, right? Yeah. If any, and if anything, if the data tells you anything, it's always moving somewhere. It'll become less volatile. I think that's what I should say. I mean, if, if we've got to be, somebody is going to be optimistic about the future, I think somewhere uh, in the near future, the market is going to be less volatile. So people can move on, mm -hmm. right? People can, you have some confidence in your future, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you can start uh, proceeding with your investment plans. Right. You know, one thing that's going on in the housing market is people are not moving. They're not putting the supply of existing homes has come down right because people are saying i'm already locked in whatever three percent interest rate i've got here why should i move why should i move yeah. because not because they're worried about the six or six and a half percent interest rate because you know every two year few years you have a refinance boom you can always refinance so it's not the cost to you is not too much i mean right. in pure interest rate standpoint right. it's more about is it going to stay at six or is it going to go more right but also when is the house price appreciation going to flatten out well here it already has it has but are they watching is going to come down right you're right it's flattened out are they watching is it going to come down so where is the price going to stable uh, stabilize that so they, they basically they're waiting to see the volatility come down so they can also move with their plans and that will improve the supply yeah. they'll automatically bring a balance in your housing market yeah so it's a matter of time when we don't know if i knew i'll be a multi multi millionaire there by you now go, there you go. well the one thing that i'm watching is price of lumber right <laughs> and the oh, and the price of lumber at the <coughs> wholesale level has gone down but they're they're not dropping it very fast on the retail side because there's not as much demand as they had before correct so now they've got supply that they need to they need to offload at the price that they paid and not at what's coming so it's a it's a it's interesting it'll it'll be, it'll be interesting to see where it goes um, and as long as the, those that are on both sides, as we, that we were talking about earlier, have some moderation in their activities, uh, I think the rest of us can get along better. Yeah. I mean, I was watching Bloomberg the other day and they were saying one of the critical things, um, uh, was, they were saying is you got to teach consumers, educate the consumers to start spending less. I think that is key. Well, we'll see. Whether we can, yeah, well, at some level, they're being forced to. <laughs> hey, you, you log into Amazon your, and you order your, and your food goes up, you know, there's less. Now you exclude them. I mean, it becomes easier, right? I mean, if you have to go to a store and buy things, you think, right? Yeah. You have to take your car, you have to drive. There's a lot more inertia out there rather than, you know, logging into your Amazon account and, you know, ordering a few things with a credit card, you're done. Right. Before you know, it's 500 bucks down the drain. Right. Right. And, uh, only thing that catches the eye is free shipping. A, I'm going to buy it. Right? <laughs> I would just spend hundred dollars more. It's free shipping. Yeah. Right? So, but people will. Uh, I mean, I, I think it'll all normalize. Like I said. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for going there. I appreciate that. It's a. Uh, it, it is a fascinating time that we live in. Uh, what is it? The, the old Chinese proverb: "May you live in in uh, interesting times." Oh yeah. <laughs> I think we do. Absolutely. Um, final com or final topic. I'm just going to ask you. You know, if we've we've got kind of got, come all the way around to, um, and I think you just said I think everything is normalizing, and I think so too. Uh, not just financially though, but also politically and emotionally, from that term tumultuous period that we had a couple of years ago. Um, but if, as you look at society today, if there was one attitude that you could have the Laxman magic wand and say, no more of that, what would that be? What would the attitude be that you would want to get rid of? I would just say impatience, right? I mean, that's, a, that's what is missing now. Okay. Because, um, I mean, social media is great, but social media can also be 
it's a tool people use to voice their opinions and they're a bit too I, I don't want to use the word careless yeah maybe the term is free too free with that right? yeah. I mean if you just can hold back and worry about it, it's, it's the same thing what we touched on the beginning of the uh, beginning of this session right I mean if you start moving away from the tails in your views and start moving close to the center I think you know it will be in a much better spot yeah because I mean, and social media does a lot of this, you know. It's, I'm not against social media. I love social media, but it you know, it's be good and, as well as bad. So you start liking, right? Something you start liking a post, and you start getting fed a similar, similar post, right. right? That is what the algorithms do. Right. And before you know, right, your mind is just filled with one side of the story. Right. And it's like what George Costanza says, right, in Seinfeld. Yeah. It's not a lie if you don't think it's not a lie, right? And, you know, we start believing in it so much. Yeah. It just fills your head with it. And you, see, you start telling yourself the same thing. Yeah. I think that's true. I think that's true. I think that's true. And before you're not, you're stuck to your side. So that's why I said what I said, right? I mean, if you can, if you're really interested in something, you know, don't get all your history lesson from Wikipedia, LinkedIn, yeah. and YouTube. Yeah. Go read some actual good books written by good people. And then form your opinion. You know, very informed opinion. But it's easily, it's easily said than done or seek knowledge, right? Yeah, it's easily said than done, you know, uh, but the other, you just need to be patient, man. I mean, if somebody, if I had a magic wand, including myself, right, I'll just say, drive everybody's patience level, tolerance level up a few notches. Yeah. So people will hear more, right? When you're patient, you'll listen, yeah. right? If you're not patient, you're just blocking people out. Yeah. So. There's a, a good friend of mine who lives in Atlanta now, uh, Judy Glicksmith. And um, for years here in Texas, she she walked around. She had a cowboy hat and boots on. She was uh, her company did uh, technical documentation, and um, and I would always have her come to my leadership class because I was like, tell your story about why you wear boots and a hat, because she had had cancer, and in that cancer she saw the potential end, right. And, um, and when she saw that, she made a decision. Uh, first of all, when she was in chemotherapy, she had to sit and be. And what you said kind of reminded me of her, of her aha moment during that time. What that meant was that she couldn't, she couldn't focus on a television show. She couldn't read because she was just, I mean, chemotherapy is trying to kill you, oh, yeah. right? So it, it's, it, there's a lot of pain involved with it, I'm guessing. I've not fortunately had to go through that, but it's an interesting thing that she described. Um, so sitting and being became a way that she, uh, for the first time in her life, she had patience, but it was forced patience. But then that became a practice of meditation and of prayer because she had a, she had a background in that. Okay. Um, and, and so sometimes the painful things that we go through in life are teachers for us. Um, and I think your point on patience is a very powerful one. Um, we could all use a lot more of it. Oh, absolutely. So, and if we're like Judy, we're going to sit and be sometimes <laughs> instead of, uh, typing the answer right away on that response. Right. Just read it. Yeah. Uh, I don't blog. I don't, um, I'm not a, I'm a big social media yeah. participation uh, participant. Yeah, but uh, I read. But um, like I said, man, I mean, half the time that's all comes into my mind is yeah. like just take a step back. Yeah, before very cool. This, before you type and send. Well, I think we've we've covered all the ground that that you and I had set to cover. I think it was a really interesting and powerful conversation. So I appreciate you coming out uh, on this beautiful Saturday morning. So I think we can end there unless there's something else that you have online that you'd like to share. I don't know. I'm, again, thank you for the opportunity. Great conversation. Yeah. And uh, we've been talking about this for a while. Yeah. I've been moving schedule on you for some time. That's, that's life, man. <laughs> it, so you got to do it. It is. Glad you were able to do it today. All right. Well, very good. Well, thanks very much, uh, Laxman, for coming out today. For those of you who'd like to stay in touch with Laxman, you can do that on LinkedIn uh, and myself as well. And if you're interested in learning any of the topics that we've talked about from a, uh, from a courseware perspective, you can go to Leadership in 
uh, .thinkific and check out the things that I have out there. So thanks very much, Laxman, for coming out. I appreciate you, and we'll see you next time, all right? Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.